Good evening, friends, and uh, welcome to part two of our uh, Bible study. Tonight, uh, Michael Ray and I will be discussing Philippians chapter one. So in our last study, we talked a little bit about um, an introduction to the book of Philippians, to the background of Philippi, and uh, and kind of made some comments about leading into this. And as we've said before, um, you know, kind of our goal here is just to talk through it. This, uh, for those of you tuning in hoping for a verse by verse study, that's not what you're going to get. Um, so we're just going to kind of talk through some text and, you know, a, a little bit, as we said in the first, uh, our first study, what we're going to try to do is, is just how we would parse this out, things that jump off the page to us, things that we think are interesting points and, um, and kind of build some stuff around that. Um, so that's our goal. We, um, thank you for tuning in. I think um, we had a couple hundred views on the first one. Um, I assure you multiple of them were not me. Um, so maybe uh, maybe we had a few people that, that liked it. We got some comments in there. And so we appreciate you tuning in. Um, again, joining with me tonight, uh, live in action from Somerset is Michael Ray. Evening, Michael. What is happening, my friend? Who wouldn't want to watch a CPA and a CFP talk about Philippians? I mean, <laughs> that is just a setup for, for positive content. content. Right. The only thing would be better is if we had a long discussion about fiduciary relationships. Well, I think that comes in chapter three. A little bit. <laughs> uh, perfect. So, so it, let's, let's start real quick with cleaning a couple things up. Um, Johnny, uh, who also happens to be um, Michael's brother-in-law, and I think by marriage decree had to watch it, um, had some questions about, um, you know, when we talked about the background of the church, um, there is a few things you can read commentary-wise. Um, I'm partial to the N-I-C-N-T or N-I-C-N-T, um, New International Commentary of the New Testament. Um, you can find some stuff there, but specifically what I was referring to in some of the background is um, there's a collection of writings of early church fathers called the Patristics. Um, if you Google that and look that up, um, there is um, some allusions to um, Ignatius and Polycarp, um, who uh, wrote letters. Polycarp actually wrote a letter to the Philippians similar to Paul's letter here, but wrote it a couple of centuries later. And both Polycarp and Ignatius uh, in their writings point to um, some of the history of it being uh, the guys that came from the prison and had worked their way up. Um, so there's some allusions there. Not that, please don't misunderstand, not that those things are necessarily scriptural. It's just some historical context. Um, and so when you place those in, um, that's kind of how we get where they, um, maybe some of the background of what made up that church. It's an interesting thought, um, you know, about it, but of course we can't know, you know, we, we know, um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in chapter two. Um, Epaphroditus was one of the members there cause he carried, um, to Paul and he's mentioned specifically Lydia is there and, and, and some others that we'll get to in chapter four. So there's some that are specific that we know absolutely were members of the church of Philippi. Um, the rest is conjecture. Um, and when you kind of put together the wealth of the city, some of that background and the fact that this group is not called wealthy, but in, and rather out of their poverty gave, you know, it, it also kind of points you in that direction. But, um, you know, it, we can't be there. The, the point, uh, rather, of looking at those things is just trying to look around the room and paint the picture the best way we can. So thank you, Johnny, for the questions, and hopefully um, looking at those things can help you with study. Um, as we jump into the text here in Philippians chapter 1, so Philippians, um, as we talked about before, is, is often talked about as a love letter kind of that Paul writes back to the church at Philippi. Some interesting things I noted were that if you look at the time of, of, of Philippians, so Paul was first at Philippi roughly in AD 52. He goes back in Acts chapter 20. So Acts chapter 16 is AD 52. Acts chapter 20, um, when he goes back up and kind of picks Dr. Luke back up from there, is about AD 56 or 57. And then Philippians is written circa AD 62. So we're talking 10 years down the road. And over those 10 years, Paul really had about maybe three or four weeks with this group. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing um, the, the connection that they have over that. But one of the things that's interesting too is, is Paul's uh, comments about how they helped once and again and even now. Um, so obviously, kind of Michael and I talked about in our last text that he was getting some kind of support, maybe paying rent and was on house arrest there in Rome. And the Philippians were, were part of that. I, I think that's what the text says. But right after, shortly after he left there, 
they're giving him support in Thessalonica, which is, which is pretty amazing. You know, this guy that they know for a couple of weeks that, that comes in town, converts him, gets thrown in jail, gets moved out of town, and, and they're helping him um, along that journey, which, which, again, that's pretty amazing. So Paul's writing back to them. He's touched with this. And as kind of as you get into the text here in Philippians chapter 1, Michael, tell me what are some of those things that just jump off the page at you? What are some, some thoughts here in, in chapter 1 right away? Well, uh, I think something you already said is, you know, I don't think you can read any of this without, without kind of thinking about the Philippians' generosity, um, because that, that's what Paul seemed to note about them time and again, not, not only in this letter, but when he referred to them in other letters, Second Corinthians, Thessalonians, you mentioned. And so, so you kind of, you know that about them going in, that you kind of got that expectation about their generosity. And the other thing that I don't know that, that I don't have a frame of reference for, I can't relate to, is how um, disrupted the communication had to be between Paul and Philippians, right? I mean, so so they're they're passing letters back and forth, you would uh, ostensibly, and 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 but there are there are months, if not years, between the communication. I don't know that we have a parallel for that. I, I don't know if we have a a process for that in our modern world where Paul is is anxious to tell them something and then having to wait months or a year to get a reply is is pretty phenomenal. Um, and, and again, I don't, I don't know if we have a, a parallel to that. And so it kind of leads to my first point or, 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 or question or, or jumped out at me is because we don't have a parallel for that, or I don't have a frame of reference for that, a question that, that, you know, I guess the closest thing I can think of is, is having a baby. It's a question you got to wait nine months to answer, <laughs> but, even, but, but even, but even that, like technology allows us to know so many answers before we get to that, before we get to that day. Um, but, but so that receiving a letter from Paul was, it had to be an event. I mean, so I mean, in, in first one, so here, here'd be my kind of jumping off point as a conversation about Philippians is so Paul and Timothy or verse one slaves of Jesus Christ to the saints who are in, who are in Jesus in Philippi with the overseers, the elders and the deacons. So can you imagine what is the, what is the scene when this letter arrives, what do they do with this letter? How many times is it read? I mean, I, I, I'm, I have a hard time picturing the um, pageantry that comes along when this letter from Paul shows up. I, I just, again, I don't, I don't know that we have a modern parallel to this. A soldier coming back from war or, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain to try to think of what do we have in, in life that the, the, the communication is this infrequent and would be that precious to you when it showed up. All right, so obviously, uh, you and I are the same age, so uh, obviously your memory is failing you, or you do not remember what it was like to have a summer camp romance. Uh, <laughs> that, that's that's kind of what this terrible parallel that I think about. Um, I, I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate. Tell, to tell me more. And back in the day, circa mid-90s, you know, you meet somebody at summer camp and you write them a letter. There was no long distance phone calls and that kind of stuff. You meet you know, somebody that's two or three states away and you sit down and you write them a letter and then you wait and you hope that they get said letter and hope that your corny, cheesy lines in said letter evokes enough memories that they write you back. And it is absolute torture for multiple months. And is there any ex are there any extant manuscripts of this? <laughs> that, is, that would be a precious document to me. I'm sure they've been burned. Um, but, uh, but then you, you, know, you take that, and, and that, that one letter, especially if there's anything nice in it about you, uh, you, get, you read that multiple times, and you wear out you know, kind of the pages of it as you think about this and think about response and, and go through that. So you know, that's the best parallel I can give when I think about it is, is that now what's ruined that in our society is texting you know these kids don't know what it's like you know I, our kids go to summer camp together and you know they meet some girl and they're texting while we're in the car driving back you know it's there's no fun of, of waiting and trying to get out a letter and uh although I think it would be hysterical to watch either one of our boys try to write a letter to some girl <laughs> love every second of that uh but you, you, all of that instant communication kind of is, is to your point, has kind of ruined some of that for us. There is immediate gratification. I can pick up my phone, I can text somebody, and within a few minutes, you're going to respond. Uh, you know, and, and there's that, that, that constant back and forth. But here is even worse. I mean, our, our postal service is at least halfway decent. Um, 
you know, back here, it's, it's your hand carrying letters. You're not dropping it in the post office with a stamp. You're hand carrying letters back and forth. But here's one thing that's interesting. I don't, you got to, it's one of these parts of the text that you read too fast. But Epaphroditus obviously carried an initial letter and some funds from Philippi to Paul. But word gets back to the Philippians and they're concerned about Epaphroditus' health because apparently Epaphroditus has fallen ill either while they're with Paul or on his way or they've gotten some word back. So there's some at least messages that are passing back and forth here. Um, now, whether that's kind of through the grapevine with travelers, and again, the important part about this to know is something that Michael picked up on last time. That's why we got to understand Philippi. Messages are getting back to Philippi because it is a major trading hub and it's a colony of Rome. So if they were in, you know, middle of nowhere outside of Asia Minor and it's not a, a hub, messages probably aren't getting back and forth as easy. But there's constant trade going back between Rome and Philippi. So on one of the ships and one of the caravans, messages can be passed back and forth. So I think it's, it's definitely an interesting, you know, dynamic of, of how it was treated. Now, all that to be said, I, I'm convinced, especially the way, um, again, I'm going to point back to some of the notes in, in both Polycarp and Ignatius, how they talked about they bundled those letters together from all these, these different preachers that interacted with them and uh, bishops of the region and whatnot, that they sought with such care. I mean, they carried those things, and these are scrolls like they were holy writings, and they took very precious care of them. It was, you know, we kind of take care of a Bible, but, you know, our covers get worn off. You know, these things would have been in protective cases, would have gotten out. They probably would have read that letter audibly in the assembly for multiple days. And again, they didn't just meet on Sunday and Wednesday. They would have met about every day and got together and read that and parsed it and thought about it and taken some thoughts from it and tried to work it in to, to what they were doing. Because these are instructions from, and, and I think sometimes we're lost on this, these are instructions from an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, these are from who, the Holy Spirit. Who you know. Who you know. And love. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, so, so it, it, it's a different connotation, I think. And this point's been made a lot in a lot of different places. But, but you know, I think we always need to be careful. How would we read it versus how do they read it? You know, um, we, we, we parse verses because we're, our scripture is divided into verses, right? And so we, you know, we mean you will parse about what do you think he means in, in verse 15? Um, the, the Philippians, at least initially, are, are soaking in the totality of the letter. They're sitting down to read the whole thing. It's, it is from the first word to the last. Um, they are, they're soaking that in, and then they're reading it again. And so it, it's, it's, it's hard to, and again, this point's been made a lot, but, but the, the whole letter, the, the, the first verse is, is made more meaningful because of the last verse and, and vice versa. It's meant to be, it's meant to be consumed as a whole. So, so we always do a little bit of damage or not damage, but be careful when, when you, when you pull out the, the verse four without thinking about the totality of the letter. And so just as a, I think as a rule of Bible study, it's important to remember that, that I don't, I don't think Paul intended for us to parse verse 15, right? I mean, or, or at least not at the exclusion of the rest of the letter. I mean, he wrote a letter to, to, and then obviously there's, there's, there's different points in the letter and different paragraphs. And maybe that's a better way to think about it, pull a paragraph out of it. But, but it was, it was meant to be consumed as, as a, as a complete document. And, and that's one of the things. So Bible study tip here, um, you know, pro tip, if you will, um, when you're studying, one of the best things for you to do is use. I'm an amateur. You're the professional. I'm just an amateur. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the best things for you to do is use some software and cut out your verses. You know, that's some yes. of the best Bible study you can do is, you know, get into an eSword or a Bible.com or somewhere and there's, there's a feature where you can just remove the verses and just read it in its entirety. One of the bad things, and, and you know, those of you that have, have heard me preach, and I know Michael's used similar phrases, is that from time to time, there's a terrible chapter break where there's a thought that's running on and somebody decided, hey, chapter three should start right here. But it's a, really a continuation of the end of chapter two's thought. And sometimes when you break that thought, you miss some things. And so, you know, again, just understand that it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not saying, Michael's not saying that, you know, the verses disrupt the quality of it, 
Um, but I think, it, it, you know, one of the things you can do to help maybe see it as they saw it is, is get rid of some of your verses, at least in a, in a thorough, straight read through. And, and sometimes you can see things a little bit better um, that way, uh, at least in, in my opinion, it, it's helped me. Yeah, no, obviously the verses are very useful and allows me and you to, to point at a specific thought more quickly. Uh, but completely agree. It's just a different experience when you read it without, without the thought that these are divided into verses. When you, when, you, when you put complete thoughts together, instead of just mentally trying to put verses together, it changes things. So anyway, from the very beginning, you know, the, the, the fact that this letter from an apostle that loved them, uh, that, that anyway, from, from verse one, that thought's got to permeate everything we read um, and, as the way, that, the way that they would have received the document. And, and that's part of, uh, when we talk about context, um, so, so another kind of thought here for, for those following along is that context is not just the verses before and the verses after. Context is the historical context. Context is how they would have received it. Context is, you know, who was sitting there to, to get this and taking it in. So I think not that, you know, not that you have to know all that history to get something out of it. Please don't misunderstand. But if you want to kind of put this thing, you know, in, in the layer cake that Michael talked about last week, it, it's understand, you know, broader pieces of this. Um, one of those pieces, um, and, and I didn't have that necessarily in my notes last time, but, but one of the pieces here I think that's also significant is, remember, you know, when he t he's going to talk about at the end of this chapter how about the suffering, remember how Paul and Silas were treated when they were, they were treated hostily. So do you think that the region, the area of Philippi, all of a sudden weren't hostile to these Christians? No, of course, that hostility continued. <clears throat> we got to remember that the, the religion of the day in a Roman colony is emperor worship. Emperor is our king, is our god, is our pharaoh, whatever. And so when these guys come along and they've got a different religion and they're talking about this Jesus, they the hostility didn't lighten up on, on this group. So they continued to suffer and when Paul makes parallels to their suffering and tells them to continue on, it's because there's a lot of suffering that's going on. He knows it firsthand. They know it firsthand. Again, in that broader context, it helps you to see why and, and why this is going to be significant for, for this group, even though they're a, you know, they're a Roman colony here and supposedly free. And so the context, as you know, not only includes you know, the verses around it, but it includes their past He's had, Paul has a past with these people, with these actual humans. See, their, their relationship is part of the context. Where Paul is is part of the context. What he's been through since he saw them is part of the context. Context. Who he sends with the letter is part of the context. Timothy is, is, is an enormous part of the context here. So, um, again, they're not saying that you can't get a lot from the book without knowing those things, but it, it, it just adds to the meaning when, when you kind of add some of, uh, some of that flavor to it. Now, so, yeah, it, it, it makes some of the other things jump out, maybe that you, and again, these are what we talked about before, some of the minor details that we're like, ah, well, let me get to, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, you know, let me skip over this first part, but there's depth there, there's richness that makes the rest of it, you know, come more alive. So he, you know, chapter one, there's a prayer for the church in verses kind of three through 11, and how much he thinks about them and, and enjoys in them, and, and he mentions verse 12, his situation has advanced the gospel. There, there's a lesson there that I didn't have as one of my thoughts, but, you know, I, if you think about the context of where we are, you know, hashtag quarantine life, you know, I think that what, how has our situation um, actually turned out to advance our, the gospel? How has our situation actually turned out to better our situation? Um, and and I, I don't, I don't mean that at all to minimize the people who are suffering um, physically or economically, but I do think that it has given a lot of people an opportunity to, um, slow down their lives a little bit and, and in a good way. And I, I'm in that group, uh, you know, things that I, ha I heard somebody say, and I think it was pretty poignant. They said, uh, you know, this, this whole thing has been a pretty good idol identifier um, because, because the, the things that, the things that you have stripped away, you kind of determine how important they were to you. Um, and so when it gets down to it and you're with your family and you're, what you got left is family and Bible study and eating, eating together every day. Uh, it pulls some of that back. So anyway, I, I thought that was interesting out of verse 12. My situation has actually turned out to advance the gospel. Uh, right. God's well, pretty, we're, pretty cool we're not, about that. We're not quarantined. We're healthy at home. Thank you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you're Andy. 
<laughs> what I've learned is that I like eating in restaurants, being non-essential and touching my face, all of things that I can't do right now. Idols. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but it, it, that, that's a great point. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that, that um, so for, for those of you that, that don't know or, or didn't catch us last week, Michael is brand new to the social media Facebook world. Um, so he's just starting to experience some of the stuff. But one of the cool things for me is there's a bunch of preachers all over the country that I'm friends with. And when I pull up my Facebook feed throughout the week, there are a dozen of these Bible studies like this that are going on where guys like me and Michael are separated by some distance and we just need to sharpen each other's iron. We just need to talk some things out to continue our Bible study. And as much as we miss the gathering with our church families, guys are figuring out another way to do it. You know, that's the, what's it, the necessity is the mother of all invention. So we're figuring out ways to do this. And, and I think it's incredible to go from my Facebook feed, which is normally nonsense and people bickering or sharing pictures of, of ways for people to hack them. And instead of that, it's, you know, I got a bunch of guys doing Bible studies. And I think that's incredible. And I think it's incredible that there's a cross section of people in my life that maybe never had an opportunity to hear me preach, to hear me um, study the Bible with one of my best friends uh, that now can sit in on this. And I think that's just, there's something really cool about that. And if it's because of COVID or whatever else, you know, I can honestly say I'm thankful for it. Amen. Uh, so here, here's my, here's my next gotcha question because genuinely don't understand I'm reaching out here. So verse 15, uh, I'm in, I'm in the net version. Uh, we should note that I'm in the net version, Philippians chapter one, verse 15. Some to be sure are preaching the preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Um, the former talking about those who preach from envy and rivalry, proclaim Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely because they think they can cause trouble for me in my imprisonment. How do you do that, Michael Estes? How do you preach from envy and rivalry to cause, try to cause Paul trouble? I, 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 don't, I don't know if I feel comfortable the way you're asking me that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I have great friends here, people. That's the moral of, of the question. But um, seriously, I, I, I think that that's a very interesting way that he puts that. And, um, you know, when you think about motivation behind something and, you know, there's a very difficult line here, I think that, that we got to talk through is, you know, the ends can't justify the means, right? You know, and oftentimes you hear that as an argument, like, well, as long as good's done, doesn't matter how you do good that it's done. And, and I've heard and talked to people that come right here to this verse and say that, say, well, you know, see these people, we're doing it, you know, out of their own selfish ambition, out of rivalry. And, and I think we can fall into that trap today. You know, one of the things that, that um, you know, I, I've kind of noticed talking with, with a few friends um, online in these things is there are, and again, I don't want to mention any names. I'm not knocking anybody. And, and if you're, you know, listening to this and, and you think I'm talking about you, maybe I am. I don't know. But I've heard guys talk about how many views their sermon gets versus other guys. Yeah. You know, hey, I'm at, you know, small country church X and we only got 30 here and I got, you know, 1200 views on my sermon and Joe who preaches at big city church Y with 300 people didn't even get 300 people to view his sermon. And so, you know, you got this kind of envy and rivalry nonsense going on, which you know, again, some of that, that you got, that's some heart issues that as an individual you got to deal with. But I think to Paul's point, my Facebook feeds flooded with guys preaching the gospel. I think that's incredible that Jesus is being preached. Truth is being taught. People can stumble upon that. Even if maybe necessarily you got bad motives that you're flooding Facebook with this stuff. Cause you're trying to get a job or you're trying to one up another guy that you know, or, or some nonsense like that. So I think there can be some of that, that, that rivalry dissension, if they're trying to say, and I'm just trying to kind of picture in my, myself through this is that, well, you know, there's the apostle Paul, but I'm a better preacher than he is. You know, listen at the, look at the crowds that I get and how many people come to hear me and he's an apostle. Well, you know, Paul had said many times, he said it in, in a letter to the Corinthians, you know, I didn't come to you with you know, fancy wisdom or speeches or anything. I came to you preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul never set himself up as a fancy orator, but think about where he's at in Rome. There's a bunch of fancy orators there, right? There's a bunch of guys that for a living are philosophers, for a living are speakers, for a living attract crowds. And so if they can take some of the things Paul said and attract a bigger crowd than he is, 
you know, and again, for their own, own selfish reasons, they're not doing it to glorify Jesus. They're doing it to be a big name preacher. And, and obviously it's worth noting that Paul wasn't going to where the crowds were because he was stuck in an apartment somewhere chained to a Roman soldier. So, you know, there, you know, it, it's, it would be relatively easy to find a crowd in Rome if you're saying the right stuff, right? But, you know, who, who was hearing Paul were having to search out to find him. Right. Although, you know, whoever was hearing him was taking it through the rest of the Praetorian Guard, right? You know, so his was spreading like wildfire. Yeah, or the Praetorian Guard was the ones he was chained to, you know, <laughs> were, were rotating, rotating through them all. They had, their, they had their half a day of listening to Paul. I can just imagine, you get Paul again, yeah, you're going to hear more Jesus. Yeah, I got another half a day of Jesus. <laughs> Uh, kind of great. And I think that that's part of it too. So there, there's some of that. So let me ask the follow-up question to that though, is, you know, given that, I mean, is there, I mean, is there a sense where preaching would be wrong? I mean, is there a situation where you would say it's, it's wrong for somebody to preach, even if they're doing it with bad motives? So I think there's evidence in scripture where, where God can take bad motives and turn into good results for somebody else. And it doesn't mean that that person's motives were good or that they're justified, right? It can, it can, so, so there, it, I think it depends on the, the, uh, the point of the question. Are you saying, is that person justified or can the ends be good? Um, the ends can be good. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. The ends can be good. Jesus is being preached. And so God can take um, a charlatan, and yet bring some good out of it because again, God can do that stuff in his wisdom. He, he, he takes the, the, one of the miracles and the, the, the best things you can say about the majesty of God is, is he takes people who are blatantly anti-God and at the end uses them to his purpose, even though they're doing what they want to do. I mean, you just wrap your head around that. So, so yeah, that person is not justified, but, but God can make good out of it. And I, that point, I think, um, I think is understated and not said enough. Because, <laughs> you know, it's one thing for you to take somebody. I can take somebody that wants to do good and help them do more good. But yes. the way that God uses people, and, and I'm trying to be careful, the way that God allows these things to happen and can take Nebuchadnezzar and the, the, the scumbag that, that he was with Babylon and bring them in and use that to both punish Israel, but also bring them into a place where he could take and restore them. And depending on how you read Daniel 6, 7, and 8, maybe Nebuchadnezzar came back around and actually saw God and, and was pseudo-converted or not. I mean, I, I don't want to, that, that's God's end of the whittling stick, whether they're saved or not. So I'm not, you know, passing judgment here. But I also think to your point that there can be many of these charlatan preachers, um, whatever, that have saved a lot of people and find themselves lost. You know, I, yes. I don't think Pharaoh was saved in the end, but he did exactly what God wanted him to do. Yes. You know? So I think there's going to be people like that because we are, and that, that's one of the, I think, difficult things for us to understand is all of us are judged first and foremost individually. I'm going to have to go before God on my own merits. I'm going to have to go and answer for the things I've done and undone. But <clears throat> I may have brought 10,000 people to God and I lost myself. And I think yes. that as, as, a, as a preacher, as a Bible class teacher, as a father, as, as anyone in leadership, I think that's got to be, that's what keeps me up at night, right? Is in the realm of influencing others, you know, I, I, we've got to be careful not to lose ourselves. Well, whether it be from selfish ambition, whether it be from, you know, lacking other responsibilities, I, I just think that's part of some things that we got to make sure we don't get lost. When, when, you know, think about what Jesus said, he said, did we not in your name cast out demons? Did, you're not in your name do many, did, did we not in your name do many wonderful things? I, I am persuaded that people saw that person casting out demons in Jesus' name, doing many more wonderful works in Jesus' name. And some of that crew probably went and, and became a follower of Jesus. I, I just think that, that is, that's a reasonable thing to think, even though that person never knew Jesus, according to him. Um, so uh, that, that, that point sticks sticks with me here in in this verse that that these these preachers um had their their motive was impure but people um were hearing jesus mm -hmm. 
And, and I think that's, 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 that's the majesty of God, right? Is I can take Joe scumbag and, and he can do good for me even when he's not trying to, or even when he's trying to do more good for himself. Yes. Or even when he's actively trying to be anti-God, that's what's phenomenal. Annas and Caiaphas, you go, you know, back to the gospels, they were actively trying to suppress God and, and what they did was to God's glory. So that, that again, our, I'm, I'm too finite to, to fully piece that together, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there, that was in what, 15 and 16. And yes. Let's see. So if we, as we move down here, 21 through, through 26, I think is also, um, you know, it, it's pretty amazing as, as we move through this and Paul's, statements there you know are I mean that should be you know every one of our battle cry I mean when we think about there he said you know this is for me you know he's torn between the two I'm torn between the two and I know if I stay in the flesh it's good for you and I'm going to help you and I'm going to do good but I desire to leave to long to be with Christ for that is far better so so this you know tearing of Paul's soul within himself of I can be here and I can help people that I love, but if I go on to be with Jesus, it's far better than that. So, so the question I've got for you, Michael, is how, what do we do as, as leaders, as Bible class teachers, as, as preachers, as those that are trying to help others, what do we do to cultivate this desire that jumps off the page and Paul screams from his heart? How, how, do, we, how do you build that in somebody? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And so um, I think it's interesting. We, we, we're going through this process that we talked about earlier. We're going through this process currently in our lives of, of we've had some things stripped away from us. You know, we've had, there's a lot of people that have had their jobs stripped away from them. They, we've had sports, you know, stripped away from us. We've had, we've had Little League stripped away from us. And, and some of those things are different levels of importance to different people. Um, but it's been it's been pretty eye opening what 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 is really important and what really matters um, and so I, I guess the the question is how do you how do you come to a deeper identification of those things without having to go through a pandemic which, which you know I hope we don't have to do this you know to to get to get to this point but um, it, it is phenomenal that that what what Paul mentions is he did not have he did not have a single personal goal right. and they, they, that that. I don't, I don't know if any of us are guilty of that. You know, he did not have a single personal goal. You know, his, 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 his goals were so tied up in Jesus. He wouldn't say, man, if I could just get out of this prison, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go back and have that cheeseburger that I had in Thessalonica. It wasn't, he was not like his mind just didn't work that way. It was, I can get to Spain and then I can get to Crete and I, you know, I, I can go back to Colossae or all, all these things. Um, but his, his, his entire, thought structure and goal structure was completely divorced from what Paul wanted, which is just, it's a very hard place to get. Well, I think not only that, but, but I, I think the other piece to it too, that, that I find amazing is something that's easy to say academically, but very hard to live is how many of us truly view death as gain. How many of us truly view and live and live and act upon the fact that death is better. I mean, we hold on to this life and do everything we can for this life to be here and to stay in this life. And, and maybe for some of Paul's reasons, but maybe for some other selfish reasons, right? But do we truly, I mean, believe with everything that we are that death is gain? I think if we do, then our actions would be different. I think how we view our perspective on the world is different. I think our, you know, it, it changes that worldview when truly death is gain and death is not loss. You know, I, we mourn and maybe rightfully so at funerals, but it, as a Christian, I mean, that, that really should be more of a celebration. You know, they've got their reward. This is a great thing for them that they've gone on to be with Jesus. Yes, we miss them in the flesh, but this is what we've been working our whole lives towards. I mean, that's, that's like, you know, and this is a terrible, terrible, terrible analogy, but, you know, it's, it's like getting, you know, through the end of college, and, and we're at graduation and we say, ah, you know, I'd rather stay in college. You know, it, it's not a culmination. It's not a, yes, this is, I've been in school my whole life and now I'm out and I get to go and do and be and run. 
it's more like I want to try to hang on to something that's fleeting, that's perishing, that was only supposed to be temporary anyway. You know, it's, it's pretty telling when a Christian's fear of death is equivalent to the world's fear of death. There's 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 the Jesus problem, right? I mean, it's just I mean, I, I think it's pretty fundamental, and and um, that 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 uh, that that fear, if that if that fear exists, it it speaks it speaks to a problem, um, and and we we're not we're not comfortable with that, and we don't we don't talk about that very often. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you get to that how do you get to that point? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, uh, not necessarily I'm throwing that as a gotcha that we could solve that tonight. But I think, you know, as uh, you know, again, it, depending on where you sit as you're viewing this, you know, those that we have influence over in life, whether it be because we're a Bible class teacher, because we're a preacher, because we're a deacon, because we're an elder, because whatever we sit, I mean, I think this has got to be, it's got to be what we're trying to cultivate people. You know, this is, this is the faith test, right? If you've, if you've, if we've got your faith, right. If we've helped, guide you to Jesus correctly and you're wholly absorbed in Jesus, this is what it looks like. And I think if, if that's our litmus test, maybe some of us uh, need to go back and, and need to, need to, to reevaluate our faith and maybe, you know, uh, work on that a little bit more. And, and maybe we're not where we, where we want to be. Yeah, I do think it's interesting how much of human institutions and human life and human government is tied to the notion that all of us are going to, cling to life with our fingernails dug in not letting go that every every second that we can add to our life is worth an infinite number of dollars that that worldview is just permeates everything and, and we, it's easy to get caught in that that oh well you know as, as long as is it if they can live six more months it's worth any cost and you know i'm not sure that that paul would reflect that attitude right yeah, and, and and definitely from we fast forward a little bit, um, you know, to, to the end of of Second Timothy, where he's, you know, I'm I'm poured out as a drink offering, but but listen to those words, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, I've finished the course. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. It, he wasn't sad; he was dying. I mean, and he was he was going to get executed, but yes. Paul wasn't in the least bit worried about that. I, I mean, I don't see. I don't see the tears on the page of the end of second Timothy. I see, Hey, this is, this is what I've been working towards. I mean, yeah. I'm sure and, and, rather not die of beheading, but. Yeah. And, and I think we'd put all the necessary disclaimers in there. We're not rooting for people to die and we don't want, none of us have a death wish. Right. And, and we, we want everyone, you know, I think, you know, to have uh, the, the peaceful um, exit of this life that we wish they could have. But uh, the the worldview of um, life on this earth is the ultimate uh, salvage at any at any cost. That it's easy for Christians to fall into that worldview. Yeah, it's it's, it's good to have friends. It's good to have a CPA for disclosures. They're, they're... <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, here's one here's one for you, my friend. I'm in I'm in verse 25 and 26, and again I'm in I'm in the uh, I'm in the net Bible. And so something that, that, um, was in that version. Disclaimer, tell the, tell our friends what the net Bible is. Uh, I don't know, man. What is it? New, uh, new English uh, translation. Is it new English? I can't even remember. I can't, uh, yeah. New English. Um, there's a great story behind how the new English came around by the way, but I'll let everybody look that up on their own. Um, so now I've lost my place. I was trying to look up what that meant. Okay. So verse 25, 26, since I am sure of this, I know I will remain. This is after he says to die, is, to live, is Christ dies game. But I'm sure that I will remain, continue with all of you for your sake and your progress, so that what you can be proud of may increase because of me in Christ Jesus. That that struck me. That is the in that's the only place that I'm aware of in any version, in any place where pride or proud is referred to in any kind of positive context in Scripture. And I'm not even sure it's a great translation, <laughs> but, but that, but that, that proud is referred to there in a positive context. Anyway, jumped off the page at me because, um, so the question, the question I think worth the discussion is, is it, um, is it okay for a Christian to say they're proud of something? Um, is it okay to have pride in something? Um, that's, that's a, uh, that's a pretty dirty Bible word. Uh, and so I, I, I try to handle it cautiously, but the, but the use of it here caught my attention. All right. So uh, 
for those of you keeping score at home, Michael said that the New English translation is a terrible translation. Yet he's used <laughs> twice tonight, not five tonight. So, I don't know if that's worth noting for the record keepers. But uh, I have my flaws also, but I like me. <laughs> I, I'm honestly stalling for time while I think this through. So one of the important things with, with words, with phrases, is the difference between definition and connotation. So what, what Michael rightfully said was that the connotation of pride biblically is terrible. I mean, it's, you know, that is a bad word. That is a four letter, five letter word. You do not say stuff like that. I mean, it's just awful. But when you dig into the definition of it, you know, to have a sense of pride in your community, in your family, uh, are good things. They're generally good values that we have. Now, we also see, uh, you know, Paul mentioning in, um, in 1 Corinthians when he's going through his list of what makes him, what the world would say makes him a great Christian, right? He had been um, beaten and shipwrecked and flogged and all that. Well, but what does he say to all that? That doesn't matter. If I boast in anything, I boast in Jesus Christ and him crucified. So boast is going to be akin to this pride. If I have pride yes. in anything, if I boast in anything, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. So if we, if we plug that in along the same theory is that the glory or the pride, because glory is what the English standard version uses, glory or pride is where? It's, it's in Jesus, that, that by my coming, by his coming back to them, by his encouraging them, that they can have pride, that they can have glory, that they can boast in Jesus. And, and if you think about that, I mean, from where Paul's sitting on at house arrest in Rome, how, how much of a great glory is it when he's able to come back and be with them again, to encourage them again? And by the way, it's what they've been able to do in, in their partnership with him in the gospel. Look at how far the gospel spread because of the help that they've given him. That here we've got people within the, uh, the household of Caesar that are affected and influenced by the gospel. And if that's the first seeds, if you will, that lead to a, a change in the Roman government, right? Because we go from Nero to Augustus, right? You know, we, we start moving through these guys to Constantine, who's, you know, all in on Jesus, you know, right? I mean, mm. granted, mm. <laughs> he has a funny way of showing it, but he, was in, I, mean, he I think on some level uh, was a believer. So, You've got kind of this 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 shift and this change. Definitely, we would put you know Constantine and Nero in different places, right? No you know, question. They're, they're no question. Along the spectrum. No uh, question. So so I, you know look at all that good and and when we come back and get together and I think it's so interesting and it's it's Paul to a T, right? Not that we glory that he's safe and he's with them. Listen to that. Like normally, if I'm you know if I'm locked up somewhere and I come back home, you know, what we do is we throw a party, a homecoming party, right? We're so glad you're back. We're so glad you're safe. Paul said, no, we're glorying in Jesus because all this stuff's worked out and look at all the good that's happened. And this is a guy, like, let's back up to the end of Paul's story here, right? So he leaves them in, in, in Acts 26, 27, uh, you know, remember he's on his way back and then he gets stopped. And so he has to go back through the long way through Macedonia, goes back to Jerusalem, gets arrested. And then from there, he goes to Jerusalem, he leaves them, goes to Jerusalem, gets arrested, appeals to Caesar, gets shipwrecked, ends up here in Rome on house arrest. So nobody would say Paul's been on vacation since he left, right? It's been a bad road, but that's not at all his perspective. But where's the glory to that belong? Is it because Paul's a great guy and look how lucky he got? Because some of us would say dumb things like that. We would say, oh, man, Paul's so lucky. Like, he just happened to shipwreck on this island, and the natives were so friendly, and they took him in, and everything worked out great. And then he ended up, oh, but he was on house arrest. And look at how fortunate he is. Paul says, forget all that. Like, all the glories in Jesus. God put me in this position to be able to teach the gospel to these people who otherwise would have never had an opportunity at the gospel. So 
you know, I think we get to the same point is that what, what they're, what they're proud of is Jesus. I, I guess I can swallow that. I, I have, I have a little, I still have a little bit harder time with the other because of the connotation and because I think that, that the words we say do matter. And because those words have connotation that, I, that, that, at least in my, at least for me, I'm, I'm going to try to be careful with them because if I asked you, just walked you, walked up to you on the street and said, Hey, give me a, uh, give me a synonym of, of pride. Well, you would say arrogance, ego, right? I mean, that'd be the first thing that come to your mind. And so, so when we say we got pride in something, even if it's innocuous and even if we're, what we're talking about is, is, uh, the, it, it's pleasing to me or it, it causes me joy that, that we're using a word that has got some baked in arrogance and ego in it. Um, and, and it's, it is a, it is a dangerous little word to play with in my judgment. Right. Well, it, but it's, it's interesting if, if, you know, if we were to throw, um, you know, a, a thesaurus up there, other synonyms we're going to find are confidence, right? And, and, and pride, you know, when we use it in terms for, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, African-American. Ooh, so that's good. American pride. What are we going to have? Com- what are we going to have confidence in? That's another good right. question. I would, that would lead to another good question. Right. And, and I think there, there's some of those ways that, 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 that pride, that confidence, that joy, all of those things that are wrapped up in that, um, you know, can be good or can be bad. And I think it's, it's the same thing. The other, like another word that I think about that that's similar and bad connotation is leaven, right? So leaven, when used, when we look at it throughout scripture, you know, a little leaven, leaven's the whole lump. It's usually used terribly, right? That, you know, you got to beware of these evildoers because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But leaven's a change agent, right? You know, you put yeast as a, as a, as a leaven agent, right? You put yeast in dough, it causes it to rise. It affects all of the dough that it comes in contact with, but you can also be good leaven, right? It doesn't, a little leaven of the bad guy messes up the whole lump, but leaven of the good guy also can influence the whole lump. So it, it, it's the idea of being a change agent and what are you changing from? So I think sometimes when we say, oh, all of these things are bad, we got to be careful. Like, what are we talking about here? What, what is leaven? What is pride? And how is it affecting everything else within the bounds of scripture? I'm still going to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, listen, to me, I, the, the worst word, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get too far on this tangent, but to me, the, the worst word is deserve. I mean, that, that's, that's my, Ooh, yeah. That's yeah, my yeah. We, we need to, we didn't, yeah, we need to do a whole, we need to do a whole zoom on deserve. Yeah. Deserve is way, it's scary, yes. way overused. Like, like, yeah. Amen to that. Both, both consciously and subconsciously. I mean, just grace and des- grace and deserve go like this. They, they they never cross and never mesh. No, and polar opposites. Um, yeah. So uh, w- the last thought here, I think it's interesting, is leading into that um, too. Paul talks about and writes about their suffering, and so suffering is a theme you see all throughout the New Testament, right? everywhere it, it, i mean peter's writing about it in first and second peter um you know paul's writing about it here he's writing about it to those in rome i mean it, it's all over the book of revelation the book of revelation is essentially how to deal with suffering right why is suffering inextricably linked to christianity why do those two have to go together that's a great question uh I'm going to let you bet first. I'm going to form my thoughts. <laughs> Just dive, dick, duck, dip, dodge, dodge, and dive. Is that that from Dodgeball, the movie Dodgeball? Um, so it, here, here's, the, I guess, the way I think of it is um, because the world hated Jesus, anybody that's going to be like Jesus has to be hated. So, I mean, it, it's, we're just, you know, and, and again, Jesus talks about that. You know, my, my little children, don't be upset because they hate you. They hate me and they only hate you because you're a part of me. You know, that, that's, that's the, the kind of the, um, you know, calming that we get from Jesus when, it, when addressing the topic is that when we follow him, we should be hated by the world. We should be expelled by the world because we're different. We can't be like the world. The world hates things that are different. And the, to me, the, the best example of that is, and, and for anybody listening and, and, and you can do it, you know, at your house is, go back and find your high school yearbook. Like go back and go through that and look at how stupid you looked in high school. Like whatever fashion trend it was, whether you grew up in the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, 
you had some terrible fashion trends. But why did you do that? Because everybody else did too, right? And it wasn't goofy. It wasn't weird. It wasn't strange because everybody else looked like you too. But that's, that's the perfect tense is that we want so badly to look like everybody else. We'll do stupid things. We'll dress in stupid clothes. We'll do our hair goofy. We'll, we'll do all kinds of things to be just like everybody else. But when we, when we separate from that, when, when everybody else is going left and we go right, we're the weirdo, we're the stranger, we're the one that's different. And there's some built-in animosity toward that. So, yeah, so here, my, my question about that or my pushback on that slightly would be, there, there is a fine line, I think, and I agree with you, obviously. I mean, there, there's, it's to your, I think you use a good word. It's inextricably linked. Um, the, the, the difficulty I have is there's a difference between um, the world the world hating you because of, because of who you are in Jesus and making yourself a martyr. And, and so that, that is where it gets difficult. Um, because, because Jesus did one, I don't think that he ever, he ever, um, he, he was a martyr obviously, but, but he did not, he did not, uh, what, what how am I going to, What's the right way to phrase this? It's, it's, he did not martyr himself. He did not make himself a martyr. He became a yeah. martyr. Yeah. I, I know, and, know a little bit where you're going with that. But I think this is another place where definition of terms is important, right? If you suffer because you make terrible mistakes and you sin, you're not suffering for Jesus. You're suffering because you're a clown, right? You know, if, if I rob banks and end up in jail for the next 20 years, I'm not suffering for the sake of Christ in jail. I'm suffering for the sake of my bank robbing, right? And I think there's some people that their lives are a dumpster fire and it's, oh, well, look at how spiritual I am or how close I am to Christ because I'm suffering. No, you're a kleptomaniac and a liar. That's why you're suffering. Like those are you problems. Those are not Jesus problems. And, and yeah, the I, world, I would say though, the world, the world, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The world hated, the world hated Jesus because he was Jesus. Um, if if the world hates you because you are uh, you are aggressively um, antagonistic to them, that's a little different. Um, they they didn't. Uh, so so if if you're hated because you're a you're a, a you're being a uh, an angry, um, undisciplined, um, difficult person, that's different. If you're hated because you're Jesus, uh, you know. So why Jesus was hated is important. Why Jesus suffered was important. He, he, he didn't, uh, he didn't bring it. He didn't intentionally bring it on himself to make himself a martyr. He was Jesus and the people couldn't take that. So uh, there's, there's a couple of things that are really important that I want to hit on there. One, um, and, and not necessarily mention people by names, but we all know the group that was protesting funerals, right? You know, that's nonsense. You're not suffering for the sake of Jesus when you're protesting funerals. You're trying Correct. to draw attention to yourself Correct. to make a political point and to be over the top, right? Correct. That's, and I think that's the topic Michael's on, right? If you're, Correct. you know, if, if you walk into work and slap your boss with a Bible, you're not trying to do things for the good of Christ. That, that's Correct. not what's going on here. Um, but I think, you know, when we look at, and, and we'll get to this, you know, a lot in chapter four here but you know being in in the likeness of his death suffering as he suffered sharing in his sufferings you know that's more about us becoming more and more like jesus that the world's gonna hate you know that's more we're not doing that by protest and funeral we're becoming like him and the fact that we are trying to save the world from themselves you know that we are trying to be an influence for good and shining a light on darkness. Those are the type of reasons why, you know, we're going to suffer. Not because, you know, you're not suffering financial hardship because you own, you know, six cars for a family of two. Like, that's not the same thing. Um, and, and I think it's, it's significant when we talk about the source of the suffering and what, you know, what we're doing to, to be a part of that. Um, and I think all of the, all of those pieces are significant here. But but back to the the original question though is so if if being a Christian and suffering are inextricably linked, is that a litmus test to our Christianity whether or not we're suffering? I mean, didn't didn't Paul say that it was? I mean, I, I, I all think the, so in all the four. 
all that live righteously and Jesus will suffer persecution. I mean, uh, so I think it does have to be a little bit of a litmus test. Uh, and so, so that's hard. I mean, it's hard for somebody who, who likes to be well liked. And I would, I would dump myself in that bucket. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, and, and so, yeah, that, that's hard. Um, and so, so first of all, how do you define that, right? How do you define what, what persecution is? And, and I think that that's probably different in some different, um, depending on what era and culture that you live in, what, what that, what that might look at. But you know what, when, when you put yourself out there, um, as you do, you know, as, as an evangelist, and it's, I guess kind of as we're doing right now, that, that we're going to get some, we're going to get some pushback, we're going to get some blowback, um, because we've gone too long, or whatever, <laughs> or other reasons, but, but, you know, sincerely, I mean, we're going to get something for something that we say at some point, and, you know, it's not, that that's not easy for somebody that likes to be liked, and I know that you're probably in that bucket, and I know that I am, and I, I, I have a hard time with that personally, that's just, that's just, I guess personality. Some people are are more comfortable in that role than than others, um, and so um, accepting that, and then going back to refine and say, did I did I do the best I could there? Did I do it for the right reason? And if it's still receiving that kind of response, then I gotta I gotta let that go to God and and not let it bother me. And, and I think that's the so that that's the eight hundred pound gorilla, right? Is you know, are we willing to go back and do the self-assessment and then let it go to say, you know, what, what's my role in this? What am I doing? Am I doing what I need to do? Am I standing for the cause of, of Christ? Am I making a stand for the truth or am I being a jerk? Yes. And, and I mean, that, sometimes that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I, I, I've said this a bunch of times and, and I know you've heard me say it too, is that I've won a lot of arguments and lost a lot of souls. So, uh, you know, especially, and so Michael and I met circa age, what, 23. Um, and still at that stage of my life, I was very argumentative. I was more concerned with being right than helping you and, and would argue tooth and nail um, with somebody about that and would, you know, would do things to win an argument that, that didn't matter. You know, I'd pick on how your mom or something, you know, to, to try to make a hard point in an argument as opposed to trying to find the truth and trying to help somebody see that. And I, I think sometimes Christians can go down that road where they want, they want to be right more than they want to be helpful. And, 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 and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm trying to find the right words for this. I'm not saying that you compromise the truth to somebody, but you also don't have to punch them in the face with it, right? There, there's, there's a line here where you can walk somebody through that versus telling them that they're stupid. I mean, there's, and there's, you know, there's a better way to do that. And, and some of, some of our brethren, some of my really good friends, some people that I, that I love and care about, and I know have the best intentions when they try to talk with others still come across more as argumentative and I want to be right. And therefore I need you to be wrong. And if you'll just accept that, then we can get along here, but that's the goal. And, and I think, we've got to take a step back as Christians and understand that the goal is to lead people to Jesus. And I think about Paul in, in, in Acts chapter 17, when he, when he stands up in the, the Acropolis, remember there's, there's the, he's going around to all the false gods and he, he finds the one to the unknown God. And he stands there and he says, let me tell you about the unknown God. And, and he starts talking about God, right? but he doesn't go around and talk about why all the other gods are wrong. He doesn't go and say, see, here's Zeus. He's a clown and he's mythical and he's made up and here's all the reasons why. And then let's go to Apollo and all these other, he doesn't do that. He says, let me tell you about God. Now, granted they got mad at him and, and he argued using their own dialect, but there were several in that crowd that he did have influence on because his goal was he wanted to lead people to Jesus he didn't want to attack their, their, their views and beliefs and be argumentative, but he still taught the truth. And, and I think there's, there's something there. Yeah. I, I would submit to you that um, what, what, what constitutes your suffering may tell you where, where your heart is. If, if you define suffering as, well, this person is going to dislike me because I'm going to take the truth to him so hard. And, and, you know, as, as you said, take it with, with very little grace and tact and they're going to dislike me. And so that's my form of suffering. Well, that, that's that's certainly one way to approach it. If if instead 
we take the gospel with love and grace and patience and concern. And our suffering is, um, comes about when that person that we learn to love and respect and we think loves us doesn't respond. That, that is a type of, that's a different, that's a different kind of suffering than, than we are uh, putting ourselves at the end of, you know, in, into some kind of conflict and think that, that that is what suffering requires is that, that for somebody to be in conflict with us. I, I think that, that someone um, rejecting Jesus, um, although we handle it in the right way, has, is its own kind of suffering that, that may be more noble. Right. And, and that leads to, to, to another point that I think is important here is, you know, if we're doing it right, that you're right. There should be suffering there. I should be broken hearted that they, they didn't get there. Not yes, that's I should suffering. Away thinking, well, this guy's a clown. I'm going to move on to the next one. I think there's too many people ready to knock the dust off their shoes and yes. not mourn a lost soul. He dislikes me. So I'm suffering. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that we've accomplished anything. You know, I love that person and they won't respond. That's suffering. I just, I just think that's a more noble, a more noble way to go about it. Yeah, and I'm, um, you know, the, the one of the struggles that, that that we've got here too, I think, is understanding, you know, that us not being liked is is not what he's writing about in Philippians. It's not what Peter's writing about in First and Second Peter. It's it wasn't that people didn't like them. It's they were getting their houses burned down. You know, they were you know, dragging people out, you know, they drag the neighbor out. Are you a Christian? Yes. Cut his head off and then look at you and say, how about you? Are you a Christian too? I mean, that, there's a very different level of suffering scripturally. So I, part of me struggles with the, I'm not the most popular kid in school because I'm a Christian. Mm. Not so sure. That's what he's talking about here. Not so well, sure. You know, well, you can't have it, yeah. I hear you, but you can't have it both ways. I mean, you, you can't you can't say well we're in a different culture and nobody's going to burn our house down so it's impossible for us to suffer so that that suffering has to come in in some in some manner and so if it is a uh, a less macho form of suffering that we are to experience then I suppose that that's the lot we're dealt I, I think it's just deeper than that it's you know because you're not the most popular kid in school is not not suffering like suffering is is has different forms in that. I, I think sometimes sure. we wear that as a badge of honor. Well, I wasn't homecoming king, so I suffered for the cause of Christ. No, you, come on. Like sure. not, the reason you're not QB one is not because you go to church on Wednesday nights. It's probably because you can't throw. Like sure, let's, let's but, but just because just because our suffering may be emotional and relational rather than physical, um, I, I think that may be the culture we're in. We're we're, we're very likely not going to suffer that physical um suffering and persecution and so it is going to come in those those other manners and to your point that might i mean what what you're talking about is very minimal but i I don't think that we should discount the fact that the way that we are going to suffer is probably going to be emotional and relational and 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 that's going to affect us spiritually and we're going to suffer in that way um and so I, i don't i don't think that we should discount that um versus somebody like peter and paul who may have suffered physically um, just because we're, we're in a different culture and a different time and it may affect us differently, but we got to suffer. Otherwise, what, you know, otherwise what are we doing? Well, and I, I think that's true. And I don't mean to be, be that harsh that it's not, it's gotta be emotional and relational. Maybe now who, who knows 10 years from now or 20 years from now, sure. right? Sure. You know how that evolves over time. Um, but it's also gotta be, you know, I, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and what is suffering and what is not you know, right. We, and, and, and trying to wear this, you know, badge of courage of look at, you know, God, look at how, how uh, glad you must be to have me because of all the things I've given up. Like that's, that's some nonsense. Yeah. What I would say is when Paul goes through his list of the things that he did suffer in second Corinthians, when he talks about the shipwrecks and the beatings and, and, and the, you know, all the things that he went through, he, at the end of that, at the end of that paragraph, he says, and, and, and on top of all this, or I can't remember the exact language, but, but it almost says like, and, and this is the ultimate, the concern that weighs on me daily from all the churches, the anxiety that weighs on me daily from all the churches. That was a, that was an emotional and a, and a relational weight or suffering that he equated or maybe 
said surpassed all those other things. Um, so I, anyway, I take that I take that to say we we shouldn't just be looking to get beat if we think that we're going to have to suffer for Jesus. Right. I, I, I completely agree. But I also think it's in the vein of what Paul talked about that yes. suffering. You know, Paul wasn't worried about whether he was winning a popularity contest. Right. He wasn't worried about what the world thought of him or how they viewed him. And I think sometimes for us, those things become important when they shouldn't be. The, the relational suffering, the worrying about lost souls, the worrying about churches, you know, especially that, that we have relationships with. I think there's some suffering that happens, especially if you are worshiping with the church or have worshiped with the church in the past that has some trying times and may split or may have issues. You, there's some real anxiety and strain and stuff and pain that goes through that. And it's because Amen. you love them and you love souls. Amen. Different from whether or not you're going to be elected mayor. Is, uh, is there any chance that anyone is still watching an hour and 20 minutes into this? Uh, we are an hour and 20 minutes into this. There's probably <laughs> zero chance. Um, <laughs> Maybe your mom. Hi, love. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty sure your mom turned it off like seven <laughs> minutes in. <laughs> well, you were talking the whole time. I barely got a word in. She was frustrated. Uh, that, that's understandable. <laughs> All right. So that, that being said, we are, wow. I did not realize it was this late. Um, this happens. Um, so uh, let's, let, we'll wrap up here. Kind of, I, I, for me, it was good thoughts on, on Philippians. I think parsing through some of this stuff. Um, we're going to try um, Sunday night with Philippians chapter two, um, similar format. Again, for those of you that are tuning and watching in, if you're still here at this point, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> we obviously don't deserve that. Um, However, you know, put some comments down there. If there's some stuff you'd like to see, you'd like to hear, you got questions on chapter one, maybe that we can parse at the beginning of, of our next um, next class, please. I mean, any feedback you can give us, I mean, again, we're just going to keep doing this because we enjoy it. Uh, but if, if you get yes. some feedback for us, we'll, we'll, we'll take all we can and um, try to be uh, self-deprecating enough to uh, learn from it and be better. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being with us.